Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch and Globe Trotter. Great to be joined today by Huda Amori from Palestine Action. Um, you know, I got an email just yesterday which said victory in Oldham, Elbit forced to sell Faranti after sustained direct action campaign. Now, I've written a lot of, um, you know, press releases, I suppose, or press statements one way or the other. Very rarely does a press statement coming from, um, you know, the humanitarian side of history start with the word victory. So <laughs> victory in Oldham. I don't know where Oldham is. I barely knew much about Elbit. We'll get to that. Certainly yeah. didn't know much about Ferranti, but I know something about direct action. So here we have it. Victory in Oldham, Elbit. Uh, Huda, welcome to People's Dispatch and Globetrotter. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you again. It's a great pleasure for us and congratulations. Thank you. No, it's a great victory, not just for us, but for everyone involved and, and the Palestinian people, of course. That's amazing. That's a great way to put it. But before we get any further, Huda, can you please tell us what is this thing called Elbit? And who knew that in the British Isles, they made weapons? Incredible. Yeah, no, I know. It's quite, it's quite shocking. And even for me, uh, growing up in Britain, I had no idea about it. And then as I got older, um, I started to realize that actually what Elbit is, and they are Israel's largest private arms company. Um, and their business model is basically based on developing and testing weapons um, on Palestinians who are trapped in Gaza or the Palestinians in the West Bank. And they actually develop these weapons in Gaza by and market them as battle tested on the captive population there. And then in Britain, they actually have uh, 10 sites here, um, five fa factories, well, one less factory now, actually, I have to change that, um, and two offices, and they operate in three different RAF sites, but they are basically, they're Israel's largest arms company. So as you can imagine, they produce everything under the sun when it comes to supplying the military regime. They provide 85% of Israel's military drone fleet. Um, so often if for the people of Gaza, these drones are flying above their heads constantly, day and night, entrenching uh, Israel's occupation over the Palestinian people. Um, but actually, and, and also these drones can also be used as weapons uh, to target missile strikes at, in, at, to the people of Gaza. So they have to live with these drones constantly hovering above their heads, knowing that it may have killed their their family or their neighbors or their communities by these same weapons. And actually many of these parts are built in uh, factories in Britain. Um, and Oldham is just uh, is, is an example of one of the factories where they were producing parts for Israel's drones um, here in, in England. And uh, Elbit do have factories across, across the uh, globe, but they are very densely populated um, in Britain. And I think this has a lot to do with Britain's past and support for the colonization of Palestine going back to the Balfour Declaration. But essentially, Elbit are um, murderers in our eyes and war criminals who are profiting from the oppression of Palestinians. And then not only are these weapons then tested on Palestinians, they're built here and then exported uh, to assist other oppressive regimes um, across the world. And actually, these same drones that they um, have modeled on the people of Gaza, the Brit British authorities are now contracting Elbit to supply the same drones in order to surveil and stop uh, refugees coming in um, from the English Channel into, into Britain. So not only are these weapons and Elbit profiting from forcing and displacing people out of their homes, but they're also profiting from, um, from the people when they're trying to seek safety and stopping them from even seeking safety. I mean, it's it's disgusting uh, uh, whenever you know you hear about it, and I think for me as a Palestinian, and I grew up in a northern town not far from Oldham, and finding out just how deeply entrenched Britain is uh, when it comes to um, not only supporting Israel's apartheid regime, but literally hosting their weapons factories um, here in in Britain, and you know Britain is actually um, the second. Uh, the second biggest exporter of arms across the world. And we're a tiny, tiny island, you know, so it's actually very um, populated with these types of arms companies, but specifically Elbit managed to profit 
from from this uh, deal that they have with the British government, basically. So, I mean, you know, they are making weapons in in Britain, but you said something really interesting. You said in RAF sites, that's RAF. Well, people who have watched World War Two movies know RAF, the Royal Air Force. These are British government facilities. So can you please tell us about that? It's a private company. Did you yes. say that it's operating on British government, British military facilities land? Yes, definitely. Yes, they are. They operate in three different um, in three, three of those sites, which are actually designated as Ministry of Defense land, uh, where they help. Um, sometimes they're doing simulations for, for, for when people go into battle and assisting the RAF in, in those type of things, um, but also with uh, trials for their drones and and flight simulations, um, the British Ministry of Defence, and it's something which I've noticed uh, happening even more recently, um, are heavily invested in the success of LBIP. And actually, in recent months, we've seen them make massive deals, and it's almost as if they're doing it to save Albert's skin in this country because they are being um, targeted so much by campaigning and disrupted so much, and, and uh, they are closely working with the... British um, Ministry of Defence, but also we know that their ties go much um, go right to the top of the British government. Um, when we launched our campaign against Elbit in July 2020, it was just uh, three or four weeks after uh, we launched the campaign and we'd taken action against their um, offices in London several times. So we were getting a lot of attention and we were new, we were a fresh group. And there was suddenly a meeting between the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Dominic Raab and Benny Gantz. Dominic Raab was the foreign secretary of this government um, at that time. And basically, the uh, is Israeli ministry asked uh, Dominic to crush our movement, um, which obviously, you know, I think for us was, was a success, uh, to be honest with you, to actually have such a strong reaction and to see how worried they were um, about, about not being able to operate, you know, their arms deals here in private or in secret or behind closed doors. Because often these factories are just look like normal buildings, you know, and actually part of what we do is to expose, is to expose those crimes um, of these companies. So just to uh, make sure that I'm getting this clear, Benny Gans flies from Israel to the United Kingdom or meets Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom at some point last year, mm -hmm. 2020, no, in 2020, around 19 mm -hmm. months ago or so. Uh, and it's high official of Israel tells a high official of the United Kingdom to crush a movement inside the United Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. It's as, uh, it's as shocking and as crude as you as you pull it um and it kind of to be honest i wasn't um surprised i was actually quite pleased because i thought well at least they're reacting you know i've been campaigning for palestine for a long time and to receive such a reaction you know that it's 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 shaking the right uh, feathers i don't know if that's the right term i'm quite bad at phrases sometimes but um but you know and that followed with numerous things that happened to activists taking direct action, um, including myself by the British state, you know, heavy handed policing, violent arrests, raids are like routine for us uh, at this point by the, by the British police, passports being uh, taken, devices being taken by the police. I mean, the list just goes on to show how, how they were following, you know, the orders of the Israeli ministry. Of strategic affairs and I think compared to other groups who do civil disobedience or direct action it's it's on a whole different level of approach to us as activists but nevertheless we have to plow on and I think when you're fighting against something um well, that can seem so big and daunting as Israel's largest arms company then you kind of expect that in order to actually win in the end you're going to have to overcome some massive obstacles because they're never going to make it easy for for us, you know, if it was easy, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be having to do these type of campaigns in the first place. Well, you had, again, a high official of the Israeli government telling your foreign secretary to stop you, a foreign entity 
was telling your foreign secretary to prevent you from exercising your democratic right. Now, we know that in the history of peace movements, particularly the Quakers, uh, they take the Bible very seriously. Huda, they, they read in the Bible that swords must be converted into plowshares. So famously, uh, Quakers would jump into military bases and bang on, you know, even missiles to convert swords into plowshares. And they would pour blood on the weaponry, red blood, uh, to say, you know, this is a blood thing. I first came upon the work of Palestine Action when you went in, or not you necessarily, because I don't want to put that on the table, somebody went into an Albert area and put red paint or threw red something. 18 months of sustained action by Palestine Action. Tell us a little bit. And by the way, I want to tell our viewers, the group is called Palestine Action. I think the word action is used deliberately. Tell us a little bit about Palestine Action's work regarding Elbert systems. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as you said it, the clue is kind of in our name. We're all about taking action and uh, doing more action than we talk about it. Um, and so we are a direct action network. We launched um, over 18 months ago now in July 2020. And we basically take action against Israel's armed sites here in Britain to disrupt them, blockade them, occupy their sites. Um, often in most actions, there is red paint involved, which is uh, cover, to, to cover their premises and to signify the blood shed by these companies. Um, and also on many occasions, especially at their factories, there has been a, um, a high level amount of damage and dismantling done to the machinery um, inside the factories and to the infrastructure, the, the infrastructure of the actual factory themselves. Um, and just in our first year of when we launched, we caused um, Elbit 15 million pounds in losses by doing these type of actions. Um, and, and that was with just over 100 people being, being arrested. And actually they were shut down for over 105 days, which was three months out of one year. So we, you know, we went into it with a clear mission. We wanted to shut this, this, this company down. We wanted to shut Elbit down. It was as simple as that for us. We were sick and tired of begging and appealing to politicians who weren't going to act on this issue. You know, we've been waiting and asking for this for so long. But each time something happens in Gaza or each time something happens in Palestine, there are no sanctions brought by countries like Britain. Instead, they're actually deepening their ties with Israel's apartheid regime. And I think it gets to a point and when you realize that Palestinians in Gaza and Palestinians in the West Bank and in the refugee camps um, cannot, cannot wait. The situation is urgent and we have to act with that same urgency. And you know, when you start to realize that actually these weapons are never built in front of the people that they will kill. You know, they don't build these weapons in Gaza, they won't be able to because the people would do the same thing we have done and they to stop the weapons from being produced, but they are built in front of us here in Britain where we do have privilege um, and we do have an ability to actually go out and stop these factories from operating. So for us, it's the most logical uh, thing to do when you know that most people, I think, you know, somebody was going to hurt someone um, in front of you, most people would step in the way and try and do something about it. And I think it's exactly the same principle. When you know that you have an arms factory which is building these weapons um, and will be used to kill people and has been developed on, on, on killing people, um, then, then we have a duty to actually go out and do whatever it takes. And if lobbying, if they don't respond to to uh, our call out of, of to lobbying um, of MPs and politicians, then we won't, we won't, we will do it ourselves. And I think that's the point is, you know, lives are at stake and humanity is at stake. And uh, I think when you see the inequality of the world, uh, I think for those who are in, are in a privileged position, we do have an obligation to step out of our comfort zone uh, when it comes to campaigning for these issues. Otherwise we're gonna end up in the same situation over and over again. And, you know, I think like myself, many people are tired of, of seeing what we saw in May, 2021, when we saw Gaza being bombed once again, um, with weapons again that are probably built here in Britain. And 
And even though there is global support amongst people for Palestine, it's not translated to government legislation. So for us, going out and shutting these factories down is saying we don't need the government legislation to stop Israel from being able to produce these weapons here um, in Britain. And, you know, for, for Elbit in Britain, they actually are... So and you mentioned before about not knowing um, what Oldham is, and I'm sure many people who are listening to this won't, but... Uh, these factories are normally not in the kind of metropolitan areas. They're actually in working class communities. And for example, Oldham actually has a very large Asian uh, community, very large Kashmiri community, Arabs there as well, um, who are actually, you know, weren't aware of this factory existing until the kind of action stepped up against this factory. And, you know, it's it's so insulting to see that they put they put the manufacturer of, 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 of these weapons, which we used to kill, um, you know, their, their, their communities back home right in front of them um, and think that they'll be able to get away with it. And obviously they, they, they didn't and they won't. Well, you see, they will be outraged to them, have been outraged by the, um, by the property damage that Palestine action inflicted thousands of pounds you said meanwhile thousands of palestinians killed in operation protective edge thousands of palestinians killed in gaza on a punctual basis through the year the outrage is minimal we're not even getting into bae systems and what's happening in yemen we're staying with aldam and your great victory uh, huda amori from palestine action congratulations for the victory at oldham it's really something in in I hope we can come back and talk about how Palestine Action has closed down all these factories. Congratulations. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you.